What is up, YouTube? I'm Devon DaVinci, leader of the Renaissance crew, and you're watching DaVinci Reacts. Uh, today, we're going to be getting into another episode of uh, Checkmate Lincoln Knights. This is a video that was created by Atun Shai Films. I'm, I'm going to go and watch a video of him saying his name <laughs> so that I can get it properly. I get that proper pronunciation. But um, yeah, this is a, pretty much a series dedicated to dismissing a lot of myths about the Civil War as well as misinformation about the Civil War because one of the biggest pet peeves for me is misinformation. I hate when people spread bullshit intentionally with the express purpose of just spreading it. Like, I want, like, I don't mind having a conversation about sensitive subjects, but when you intentionally try to muddy the water so you can make your side sound better, then that is where you'll, that's where you lose me. So the Civil War is, uh, with all of its lost cause, uh, um, rhetoric and everything else, or at least people that are lost causers with their rhetoric, they tend to be the worst when it comes to spreading misinformation. But Atun Shai's, uh, channel is doing a great job of not only dismissing these people but also handing them their asses so let's jump into this see what it has to offer i will have a link for uh his channel at the end of this video so the last 30 seconds you'll see a link pop up right over here click on it it will take you to their channel you can watch the video subscribe like and all the other good stuff there will also be a link in the description box for the original um video and the that way if you wanted to react to it yourself or if you wanted to watch the original without me talking and pausing it, that is where you would go to. Now, I don't know if he has a Patreon. He might have a Patreon because normally histor uh, historical channels tend to do that. But I know given the subject matter of his videos, I'm willing to guarantee a lot of his videos are probably demonetized or require a lot of appeal and headache in order to get them to be monetized. So if you do enjoy this person's uh, channel, I highly recommend you check for a Patreon link, which, matter of fact, let me just look and see if they have one. Uh, yes, there's a Patreon link. So it is www.patreon.com forward slash Atun Shai Films. Uh, you know what? I might just leave that in the uh, description box as well. Because that's the best way you can support history, uh, historical channels because they their, their content tends to get demonetized a lot. Now, with that being said, let's jump into this. Well, Billy Yank, this is sure shaping up to be a grand old Christmas time. Much better than the Christmas of 1862. All I got that year was dysentery. <laughs> and in the spirit of the I season, play Trail I too. got you something. It's not a bomb, is it? No, no, no. It's a throwback to the old days. You remember, Christmas is during the war. I know we normally give you Federal's good southern tobacco, but I heard you quit smoking recently, so... Wow, it's nicotine gum. That's actually really sweet. That's a giant-ass box for nicotine gum. You know, I actually got you something, too. Um, it's way better than that chicory crap you guys drink. Real coffee. Thank you, sir. And I went ahead and uh, brewed a cup so you could enjoy it right away. Mmm, delicious. Oh, oh you're, you're fighting me. Okay. <laughs> That's a bit of Irish coffee right there. So that's uh that's that's what we booze. call it over here, the Irish whiskey coffee. Purifies you put a little bit of the alcohol with the coffee. coffee, I think. Much healthier. I don't drink coffee way. or alcohol. That's just what I've heard. Holy hell. Amen. And Alex, to look this up, well, my ancestor was not only a great Confederate Civil War soldier of a hero in his diary, and I, I was marching <laughs> for Arkansas. I was. That's a great way to put this this comment in context. Like, was this man drunk, or was they typing on a phone and just like autocorrect was just whooping their ass? Like, so <laughs> some of these uh comments man I, like 
I, I don't get it. There, there's an edit button on YouTube. Like, this is something that would fly on Twitter, maybe, because you can't change your comment. But how can you let this fly on YouTube? Oh, man. We're covering a union cavalry. Oh, hell. We try to stop them, but I bent down almost everything. My home is gone. My black friends is not slaves. I, I knew I know how to be found. My wife is body. Is this Christian as black as I am? Us mellow being born, as he was fussing on them crowd of 1863. And if you don't believe me, why don't you go back to Washington or California or what other Yankee state you please? <laughs> Secondly, Lincoln Lacks. <laughs> That was good. Come on, buddy. Sober <laughs> up. We've got a new episode to film. Oh, man. Unless, of course, you're ready to finally concede that it was really about slavery after all. Never! It's so sad that Northerners still pretend the war was about slavery. They never want to talk about the tens of thousands of blacks who signed up to fight in the Confederate Army. Well, I don't know about Northerners, but historians have been perfectly willing to talk about black Confederates ever since that myth first originated in the 1970s. And they're in agreement as the venerable Civil War historian Gary Gallagher put it. The, the black Confederate movement, which, as I said earlier, is demented, is, is an effort to get the Confederacy right on race retrospectively. You just need to stop that. Anybody who's trying to do it, just stop it. Stop it right now. That historian is a revisionist and a liar. Over 114,000 black Confederate soldiers died defending their homes and families from a mostly white Yankee army, as this Facebook meme clearly demonstrates. Um, anything coming from America is going to be mostly white because white people make up, what, 70% of the American population? I, I don't get the point of that. And... You know what? Let's keep moving. Homes and families from a mostly white Yankee army, as this Facebook meme clearly demonstrates. Okay. As this well, Facebook meme. About that is wrong, but it is true that tens of thousands of black men did accompany Confederate armies and supported their war effort. As slaves. It's just that, don't say it, the majority of these men, he's going to say it, were <laughs> slaves. Either impressed <laughs> by the Confederate government to perform manual labor or brought by their wealthy owners to war to carry out menial tasks in camp, like cooking, cleaning clothes, or transporting supplies and provisions. A few free black men enlisted in the Confederate Army as cooks, teamsters, and musicians, but they were certainly not soldiers. Their white brethren would have made that distinction abundantly clear to them. After all, for most of the war, it was forbidden by Confederate law for black men to serve as soldiers. Yes, in 1861, the law was passed in the Confederate Congress that banned slaves from enlisting. Supply issues were chronic, and the weapons were needed for white soldiers. Despite the eagerness of the black soldiers, a decision had to be made. Consequently, the black soldiers decided to aid the white soldiers in the camps, serving as clerks, cooks, mending clothing, as well as caring for the wounded and sick. You're just making shit up now. <laughs> yeah, you got me. Hey. Still, as a New Orleanian, you ought to know better. Here's a photograph of the 1st Louisiana Native Guard, a regiment of black confederates who volunteered to serve in New Orleans in the spring of 1861. Can I answer this? I, I don't know if I'm going to be correct necessarily, but I, I recently saw something that talked about this specific thing, and I wanted to mention it. I wanted to talk about it. Which is interesting that it came up right here. Um, sometimes it seems like everything happens for a reason. Now, I just came across this particular subject, I want to say with either yesterday or today, about the, uh, the, this regiment of black people that fought in, for the Confederates, and if I'm not mistaken, the Confederate government was unaware of this regiment at the time, and when they learned about this regiment, they quickly disbanded, like, immediately. Is that about right? Am I right or wrong on that? That's not the 1st Louisiana Native Guard. That's the 25th Regiment of United States Colored Troops in a photograph taken in Philadelphia. That image, by the way, was subsequently used as a recruitment poster to try to encourage Northern blacks to enlist in the Union Army. But you are right. 
The 1st Louisiana Native Guard was an all-black militia unit in Confederate New Orleans. But they're the exception that proves the rule. As I've said repeatedly in my many videos about New Orleans history, race relations were different here than in the rest of the South. <laughs> During slavery, we had a large and unusually prosperous population of free people of color, many of whom were of mixed race and had family Creole. ties to local white aristocrats. And lots of them also owned slaves. Yeah, they, they use that except like, Whenever they, they, people talk about, like, well, black people own slaves, too, usually they're talking about people within that region. And usually when they say black, they're referring to people that were one-eighth or one-sixteenth black. Like, back then they had the whole one-drop policy where, if, like, you had a single drop of black blood in you that made you black. So these, these were people that were that would pass as white in almost any other context, but because they have a black ancestor are considered black. So technically black people own slaves in that regards. Now I'm sure there have been uh, many black people that were actually like black, black that own slaves too, but the numbers that they existed in is nowhere near as much as people that spew this bullshit want you to believe they are. Yes, exactly. So we really shouldn't be terribly surprised that they volunteered their services to the Confederacy. Besides, there was a precedent here. Free black militias had fought alongside Andrew Jackson at the Battle of New Orleans. Despite all that, the state still stymied their efforts to serve in a combat role. Uh, Louisiana law limited membership in the militia to free white males capable of bearing arms. And all the first Louisiana did was go out on parade a few times. And though surviving a New Orleans parade can often make you feel like a combat veteran, this unit never saw any real action. They were quickly disbanded by the state government, only to be right. reformed in April of 1862 when the United States Navy was threatening New Orleans. But after Confederate General Mansfield Lovell abandoned the city, the first Louisiana gave up without a fight. Interestingly, those same men then offered their services to Benjamin Butler, the military governor of the Union occupiers of New Orleans. As Butler's biographer James Parton explained, So General Butler called on Africa, not upon the slaves, but upon the free colored men of the city, whom General Jackson had enrolled in 1814. He sent for several of the most influential of this class and conversed freely with them upon this project. He asked them why they had accepted service under the Confederate government, which was set up for the distinctly avowed purpose of holding in eternal slavery their brethren and kindred. They answered that they had not dared to refuse, that they had hoped, by serving the Confederates, to advance a little nearer in equality with whites and that they longed to throw the weight of their class into the scale of the Union, and only asked an opportunity to show their devotion to the cause with which their own dearest hopes were identified. The general took them at their word. Though General Butler mm. took these guys at their word, we probably shouldn't. The mixed-race free people of color of New Orleans had always viewed themselves as superior to and distinct from slaves and full-blooded blacks, so it's very likely that they were just telling Butler what he wanted to hear. These guys left no written records of this event, so their motivations will probably always remain a mystery. But historical context can give us some clues. New Orleans was the wealthiest and most strategically important city in the entire South, and the Confederate government had relegated pitifully few resources <laughs> and manpower or materiel to defend it. Though General Lovell would be blamed for basically allowing the Union Navy to capture the city, realistically, there was nothing he could have done to stop them. And after the occupation, even diehard secessionists had lost all hope that the stainless banner would fly over the Crescent City ever again. Faced with this hard truth, the men of the 1st Louisiana may have realized that they needed to kiss Butler's ring if they had any hope in maintaining their privileged social status. That may be true for that one regiment, but have you explained the photographs and records of blacks in the Confederate Army? Don't that prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that the army of our great and glorious Confederate states was as diverse but those as the photos college don't get admissions in the context, photo? Do they? For instance, here we see Sergeant Andrew Chandler of the 44th Mississippi Infantry, together with his family servant, Silas. A family servant. Family servant, really. Of the 44th Mississippi Infantry, together with his family servant, Silas. As you can see, Silas is armed and wearing a uniform. And look at how closely the men are sitting. Their legs are touching. How can you deny the existence of black Confederate soldiers when faced with this overwhelming evidence? Let's get one thing straight here. Silas Chandler was a slave. Not a servant, a slave. That photograph was probably taken in August of 1861. Andrew Chandler, the 17-year-old son of a wealthy plantation owner, had just enlisted as a private in the Confederate Army and decided to take Silas with him 
to war. The weapons they're holding are almost certainly studio props. It was common for young volunteers after enlisting to have like, <laughs> tough guy photos taken of them. It was also common for plantation owners to take a slave or two with them to war. Many of those slaves wore some kind of uniform, just as they had done in the Mexican War. But you are right about one thing, Johnny. Their pose is unusual. Most soldiers who are photographed with their camp slaves place themselves in positions of unquestionable dominance. This one definitely feels more buddy-buddy. Exacto mundo! This is because they were the best of friends. Silas was free to travel from the plantation in Mississippi to wherever Andrew was. Andrew wrote home on the 31st of August, 1862, that the Federals might take Silas. I greatly fear another raid. Don't let them catch Silas. Be sure to write when Silas gets home. Andrew was severely wounded at the Battle of Chickamauga. The doctors were prepared to amputate his leg, but Silas refused to allow them to perform the operation. Instead, he took a piece of gold to buy whiskey, which he used to buy a bottle of whiskey to bribe the surgeons for Andrew's release. He carried his master on his back and loaded him onto a boxcar bound for Atlanta and better medical care. The two remained friends for the rest of their lives. Well, that's bullshit, but it is true that after Andrew was injured at Chickamauga, well, that's bullshit, Silas but... helped him get back to the family farm. Because he loved him. He may have. We don't know for a fact that he didn't. But I think a much more likely explanation would be Silas's love for his own wife and newborn son, who were enslaved back at the plantation in Mississippi. When you have the safety of your family to think about, then you do what your master says. If he says, come to war with me, you go. If he says, hold this shotgun and pose for a photo with me, you do it. If Silas had come home without Andrew, or, God forbid, escaped to the Yankees, who knows what would have happened to his family. We have basically no wartime records written by camp slaves themselves, so everything we know about them is filtered through the perspective of their masters. And even though stories of faithful slaves uh, firing at Yankees or carrying their wounded masters back to safety were incredibly popular in Confederate newspapers, any close reading of our sources reveals that these masters were downright deluded about the extent of their bondsmen's loyalty. Camp slaves ran away all the time, especially when the Confederate Army was in enemy territory or operating in close proximity to United States forces. In the summer of 1864, during Jubal Early's raid of Pennsylvania, the slave of one Captain Robert Park escaped. Park later wrote that, He must have been tasked away or forcibly detained by some Negro worshipper, as he had always been prompt and faithful, and seemed much attached to me. Like, it never occurred to this man that his slave may have just been feigning his affections, biding his time, waiting for an opportunity to get the fuck out of there. Your deep that definitely happens a lot, I can tell you right now. Like, especially if, uh... Like, you know somebody black that happens to have older relatives that lived in southern territories or territories where there was, like, Jim Crow and stuff like that? They will tell you about how, like, going to work and when they're out on the town, yeah, they'll sit there and, hi, how you doing? But then when they get home, they talk all types of shit. Like, it happened a lot. Like, a whole lot. His affections, biding his time, waiting for an opportunity to get the fuck out of there. You're derailing the conversation, Billy Yank. I don't deny that there were camp slaves. What I'm saying is that there were also black Confederate soldiers. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Oh, I have evidence. And claims without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. That, I believe that was uh, Christopher Hitchin. Christopher Hitchin's thing. I almost messed up one time because I, I recently did a video on... Um, uh, Carl Sagan and I made a I actually called him like Richardson uh or Christopher Dawkins I think I think I called him Christopher Dawkins <laughs> and somebody called it out and I was like oh I, like I didn't watch it but I'm going to take your word that I probably made that mistake because that sounds like something I would say uh, Christopher Hitchens namely the many photographs of black rebels at veterans events after the war we even have records of their pensions. Yes, in the early 20th century, some former camp slaves did receive state pensions. But if you're going to use those pensions as evidence for the existence of black Confederates, then you're in for a shock. The pension applications make it very clear that these former camp slaves were not considered veterans, with lines like, what was the number of the regiment in which your owner served? 
The black men at Confederate veterans events were also former camp slaves. Again, it wasn't terribly unusual for camp slaves to wear uniforms. Oh, come on! You can't weasel your way out of this one. Mm -hmm. Do you not believe the sensible and true avouch of your own eyes? If we Confederates loved racism so much, why did we invite these black men to reunions? Why did we adorn them in medals and honors? It's right there in black and white. You know, Johnny, it's really amazing. You're so knowledgeable about the Civil War. I ought to be. I fought in it. You and mm -hmm. your fellow Lost Causers could rattle off the entire order of battle at Lookout Mountain by heart. You could tell me exactly how to hook up the shoulder boards on a general's frock. You know the number of mini balls that can fit into a standard issue cartridge box. So it's shocking how unbelievably ignorant you are of all of Southern history outside of those four little years of rebellion. We shouldn't be at all surprised that former camp slaves were welcomed and honored at Confederate veterans events, especially from the 1920s on. It was the height of Jim Crow, and an important justification for segregation was that black people were being oppressed for their own good. Unlike the Lost Cause myth of today, which tries to paint the Confederacy as some sort of egalitarian paradise, the Lost Cause myth of the early 20th century maintained that blacks had been better off as slaves and that the best hope for black Americans going forward was for them to defer to white authority. But during World War I, black Southern soldiers had been treated more or less as equals in Europe and saw firsthand that a I've desegregated that. society was possible. I have in fact heard that they said, uh, I forgot what video I was looking at or if it was a comment somebody made, it might've been a comment, but they talked about how in the World Wars when black soldiers would like team up with French soldiers and things like that, they would be treated like a hundred percent equal. And it was the American like generals and stuff that were the ones telling them like, no, you guys need to stop doing that. Stop treating them that way. And I, so it's like our, our, our own, my, own, our, my own country was the one keeping us down. Whereas everybody else was like, I don't see any problem. Like they can fight. They seem like they cool. Let them, let them join us. Fuck it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's interesting when America is when America is the one country out of all these countries that consider themselves the land of the free and the home of the brave. But at the same time, it's like we are the ones that hung on to slavery and uh, unequal rights and everything else longer than just about anybody. Now like you can make the argument for South Africa, but it's like. South Africa weren't going around beating themselves on the chest talking about how free they were. Consequently, upon returning home, they aggressively fought for their rights. Many white Southerners fought back, both with violence and propaganda. Not every black Southerner was quite so radical. In fact, their politics were pretty neatly divided along generational lines. Younger black people were avowed agitators. Older black people, including many former slaves, were content not to rock the boat. Their deference gave the white elite the exact ammunition they needed to counter the activist narrative. So when former camp slaves appeared at Confederate veterans events, they were placed front and center as ideal examples of well-behaved blacks. Speaking of pensions, a 1921 article in the Confederate Veteran Magazine noted that, A new feature in the pension appropriation of Tennessee makes an allowance for pensions to the fateful Negroes who were in the war with their masters and served them to the end. Doubtless other states of the South will make similar provision for their old Negroes, whose loyalty under the circumstances showed a fine sense of honor not apparent in later generations of the race. Many of these black men also wanted to lay claim to the sense of martial masculinity that the white people of their generation enjoyed. And we can kind of see... <laughs> what is he doing? What the hell is he doing? Lord. Lord. Give me the strength to resist the Yankee invader. The violator of our homes and firesides. Let me destroy him with facts and logic, Lord. I am your humble servant. I, I know that. Lord, it's Obi Wan. It's a Christmas miracle. Yes, it's me. It's Master well, I was Kenobi. Born on Christmas. It's a vile pagan carnival, and everyone who celebrates it is going to hell. Mm. Is it my day to be with you, Lord? <laughs> if so. 
I come to you with all the joy in my heart. No, Johnny. I have come to answer your prayers. Take this. It is a book of primary sources to counter Betty's arguments. So? Thanks. Yes. Now go, my son. Go boldly into the combat. And remember, Catholics and Quakers worship the devil and should be killed. <laughs> I'll remember, Lord. Well, I wouldn't put it past Obi-Wan. I mean, the Jedi did kidnap kids and pretty much force them to, you know, join their little religious group or whatever. But at least you got all some superpowers out of the deal. You just couldn't associate with your former life in any way. You are wise and strong, and I am very proud of you. Goodbye. That's what he said to Anakin before Anakin went all Order 66 on everything. The game of the happy, faithful slave fit in neatly with the early 20th century's popular image of the Confederacy. This guy has no idea what he is talking about. There were black Confederates, and no, they weren't just cooks or camp hands. From most accounts I've read, they were riflemen, sources. First, on account by Dr. Lewis Steiner the inspector of the U.S. Sanitary Commission. In his diary, he described observing our brave boys entering Frederick, Maryland in the invasion of 1862. This morning, the rebel army began to move from our town. The most liberal calculations could not give them more than 64,000 men. Over 3,000 Negroes must be included in this number. These were clad in all kinds of uniforms. Most of the Negroes had arms, rifles, muskets, sabers, bowie knives, dirks, etc. They were supplied, in many instances, with knapsacks, haversacks, canteens, etc., and were manifestly an integral portion of the Southern Confederacy Army. Steiner was right. Slaves were an integral portion of the Confederate Army. What he's observing here are camp slaves performing one of their many functions, carrying their master's weapons and equipment on a long march. Next, on account from one of Badan's sharpshooters who saw a black confederate at the siege of Yorktown, Virginia. For a considerable time during the siege, the enemy had a Negro rifle shooter in their front who kept up a close fire on our men, and although the distance was great, yet he caused more or less annoyance by his persistent shooting. At one occasion, while at the advanced posts with the detail, the rider with his squad had an opportunity to note the skill of this determined darky with his well-aimed rifle. Damn. Yep, yeah, there are a few accounts by some United States soldiers that claim the exact same thing. Even if they correctly identified these soldiers as black, which at the distances we're talking about is a big if, it still wouldn't prove the existence of black Confederate soldiers. All it would demonstrate is that some camp slaves picked up their rifles and shot at Yankees, which is entirely believable because some slaves were genuinely loyal and in the heat of battle, who knows what could happen. And finally, in September of 1861, Frederick Douglass of all people wrote in his own newspaper that, It is now pretty well established that there are at the present moment many colored men in the Confederate army doing duty as real soldiers. There were such soldiers at Manassas, and they're probably still there. How would Douglas know? Was he at Manassas? And you're ignoring the context here. Douglas was using these rumors of armed camp slaves to try to drum up support in the North for arming black regiments. As he goes on to say in that same article, Rising above vulgar prejudice, the slaveholding rebel accepts the aid of the black man as readily as that of any other. If a bad cause can do this, why should a good cause be less wisely conducted? We insist upon it at one black regiment in such a war as this is, without being any more brave and orderly, would be worth to the government more than two of any other. And that, while the government continues to refuse the aid of colored men, thus alienating them from the national cause and giving the rebels the advantage of them, will not deserve better fortunes than it is thus far experienced. He was I love Frederick Douglass. Uh, uh, you study the man's life, you study the fact that like he pretty much built everything about himself from the ground up and had to learn everything from scratch and all that stuff and he becomes this. Like even the way he talks just sounds like regal. And it's funny enough like Back in the day, everybody kind of talked like that, but I want to know what happened. <laughs> like, within those hundred years between the 1860s, you can probably even go up as early as like the late 1800s to about 
it's like the language I'm gonna say in America I'm not gonna say in other countries because it could be different but I know in America language really went I like, really simplified from that time to the 1940s 1950s it's less concerned about the veracity of those reports as he was about their political usefulness and in any event the idea that hearsay from Union soldiers are reliable sources is absurd, and you wouldn't even be bringing that up if there was a single piece of Confederate documentation to substantiate your claims. You know, there actually were black Confederate soldiers. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. He admitted it. I think we're done here. But only after the Confederate Congress had allowed the military to enlist black soldiers in March of 1865. Yeah, I heard that like the situation got so dire that they were like, okay, well, fine, we'll do it. We'll, we'll do it. Damn. Are you happy now? <laughs> Just three weeks before the surrender at Appomattox. It was a desperate, last-ditch attempt to avoid defeat, but it didn't work. The Confederacy was doomed, in part due to the 200,000 black men who were already serving in the Union Army. By the end of the war, black soldiers made up 10% of the Union Army's manpower and had I suffered that more than 10,000 combat casualties. There were only ever a few hundred black Confederate soldiers in the spring of 1865, and they barely saw any action. And despite the public endorsement of Robert E. Lee, the idea to arm black men had been extremely controversial in the Confederacy for the better part of a year. The idea was first proposed by General Patrick Claiborne, who wrote in 1863 that, The measure will at one blow strip the enemy of foreign sympathy and assistance and transfer him to the South. It'll dry up two of his three sources of recruiting. It'll take from his Negro army the only motive it could have to fight against the South and it will probably cause much of it to desert over to us. The immediate effect of the emancipation and enrollment of Negroes in the military strength of the South would be to enable us to have armies numerically superior to those of the North and a reserve of any size we might think necessary. It would instantly remove all the vulnerability, embarrassment, and inert meekness which result from slavery. Aha! A woke Confederate general! You seriously expect me to believe that the man who wrote that fought for slavery? He was one of the better ones for sure, but Claiborne by no means spoke for the Confederate leadership. In the first days of 1864, he shared his proposal with his commanding officer, Joseph E. Johnston. Johnston dismissed it out of hand and actually ordered Claiborne to stop spreading those dangerous notions. Nevertheless, a copy of the proposal ended up on the desk of Jefferson Davis. He actually also ordered it suppressed. But as the tide of war began turning against the South, Davis won for the idea and in November of 1864 presented a watered down version of it to Congress. Congress was furious. They rejected it. But the whole thing sparked off this huge and incredibly divisive public debate. For many Confederates, arming blacks betrayed the very cause for which they were fighting. The moment you resort to Negro soldiers, your white soldiers will be lost to you. The day you make soldiers of them is the beginning of the end of the revolution. If slaves will make good soldiers, our whole theory of slavery is wrong. In my opinion, the worst calamity that could befall us would be to gain our independence by the valor of our slaves instead of our own. The day that the Army of Virginia allows a Negro regiment to enter their lines as soldiers, they will be degraded, ruined, and disgraced. I'm actually going to go to the previous guy that had their, that quote. It's funny. Like... He knows that the idea of arming black people kind of like rocks the foundation of what he was believing. But instead of seeking the truth and going, well, who knows? Maybe I'm wrong, but let's see. And if it, if I am wrong, then okay, fine, I'm wrong. That, that This is the truth. But no, he creates his theory and his idea. Instead of testing that theory, to, uh, that, you know, slavery is right. Well, let's see if something can shake that to make to see if my theory actually is right. No, he just blocks everything out and oh, this thing could prove that slavery is actually wrong. No, I'm actually going to like let's get rid of that. Let's move that out of the equation. You know, uh, oh, oh, something else. Is, like he pretty much put himself in a bubble, and anything that challenges that idea, he just dismissed instead of actually testing to see if he can get the actual truth. Of course, you'd think that in all of the Confederate records we have of the slave enlistment debate, including thousands of newspaper articles, somebody would have confirmed what Frederick Douglass and others had claimed, namely that there were already blacks serving as soldiers in the Confederate Army. But nobody did. To the contrary, they vehemently denied it. A Richmond war clerk named John Jones, who worked closely with the Davis administration throughout the war, had this to say about Northern rumors that there were black soldiers in the Confederate Army. This is utterly untrue. We have no armed slaves to fight for us. <laughs> that was just like flat out rejection. 
no. <laughs> in the words of this great Confederate uh, leader back in the day, no. <laughs> oh, I almost forgot. I, I actually got you something else. Oh. It's a big one. Looks like a picture. Oh, Lord. Do my eyes deceive? A war of northern aggression themed chess set. Why, there's old Moss Robert himself and President Davis. Yeah, Davis is the king and Lee is the queen. Uh, but, you know, Davis should really be the queen because of that whole rumor about how he was captured wearing one of his French dresses. <laughs> Unfounded slander. Oh, and look, here's the tyrant Lincoln. He must be the king, and Grant the Butcher is the queen. Now that is fitting, considering how Grant played the role of Desdemona in their production of Othello at that fort out west before the Mexican War. Yeah, okay. And for the role, he dressed as a woman. Yeah, I, I get the joke, yeah. And the rook's got little cannons on him and everything. Thank you, Billy Yang. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you too, my friend. Fancy a game? Let's do it. I'll whip you harder than at first Manassas. Why don't, uh, why don't you move first? After all, you did start the war. Ha ha, very funny. White pieces always go first. Because chess is racist. Stop it. I mean, I don't think the song is copyright claimed. I, at least I would hope not. <laughs> but um, you never know with YouTube. Um, yeah, like there's a lot of different things that pop up during these whole Lost Cause debates. And the thing is, you'll get into a conversation with people. Oh, Alternate History Hub is actually a patron of his. That's cool. That's real cool. Um, Whenever you get into these types of uh, discussions with people that are lost causers or flat earthers or anti-vaxxers or... Hell, even recently I had discussions with people that were religious because, you know, the Carl Sagan video. And it's like... They fall into a lot of the fallacies that they claim that you fall into. Like, they come in trying to be like this big-time debater by listing all the things you got wrong, but then will immediately fall into the very fallacies that they claim you're using. Like, right after you, uh, like, reply to them. So, it, like, I'm just wondering, like, do you not see that you're doing it? You don't see? I'm not going to lie. I, I've ran into fallacies a lot, too. Matter of fact, one of the things that I tend to do a lot is, um, technically an argument from ignorance like somebody make an argument and then i'll make another argument and even though it's rather solid it's based on the idea of like come on now you know why this is happening like if i were to i'm trying to think of a good example if i were to talk to someone about um let's say we're talking about the civil war and Well, no, let's, let's, I'll tell you that. Let's, let, let's say we're talking about Republicans and Democrats as far as, like, the party switch. And somebody makes the argument of, well, the Democrats are the same. They're the ones that started this, this, and this, and they're still, you know, the same party and this, that, and the other. And I argue back with the fact that the modern Republican, well, this is a very sensitive subject. Well, fuck it. It's facts. The modern Republican Party is the party that you'll see most frequently waving Confederate flags at rallies and stuff like that. So how could you say that the Confederates are still Democrat when clearly only one of those groups have Confederates at their rallies? Not to mention the whole thing with the American Independence Party and... I'm not going to go deep into it because if I was like if somebody wants to have a discussion with it, I will I will have that discussion with you. 
but I feel like it'd be kind of unfair if I make this argument on video because chances are a lot of people that watch this aren't going to go and see your reply. So it's like I get a advantage in the argument going in. I don't, I'm not above it. It's just that it just and initially it seems wrong. <laughs> Maybe one day I'll have a video dedicated to it. And that would be that way somebody would know ahead of time going in what to expect. This seems like I catch you off guard because this is a different subject than what the video is necessarily talking about. It's slightly related, but not the main subject. But um, that's one of the examples I'm talking about. Like, oh, you see those flags flying in these rallies. What do you think is like that? It's an argument from ignorance, technically, because I'm not. Because you can't just say, like, what do you think as like an, an argument from a logical standpoint and it be 100 percent like evidence. But. Sometimes some things are so, some things are so like common sense worthy that it's like, hell no, I don't think you're willing, I think I would get a pass this one. It's like if I said, well, from a philosophical standpoint, I don't know what is outside my house right now. I can't see out my window, I can't see out my door. For all I know right now, I could be in outer space and there could be a killer alien right outside my door. Technically, from a philosophical standpoint, could be. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not aware of what's out there right now. Anything could be like happening right now, but let's be real. Chances are I'm not floating in space right now. <laughs> like, the, the chances are, but, uh, Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe, and share. Um, I look forward to seeing you in the comment section down below. And, you know, again, give uh, Atun Shai's channel a like, a view, a subscription, whatever else. Like I said, I will have the link for the original video. I will have a link for the channel in this video right here that will appear in the icon. And I will have a link for the Patreon which will be in my description box. Normally I have you go to their description box, but this time I'll just do it in my su subscription box. Who knows, maybe I'll start doing that from now on whenever I do reactions to history, video, uh, history channels because I know the struggle that they tend to go through when it comes to uploading these types of videos. But with that being said, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up. So I'm Devon Da Vinci, hopefully you've been enlightened. I'm giving you the deuces and I'm signing out. Peace.